Hi, I'm here with Gabe Klein, and we're going to talk about his new book, Startup City. Gabe is the former commissioner of the Departments of Transportation in Washington, D.C. and Chicago, and a serial entrepreneur and a very interesting guy who has a lot of ideas about the future of transportation in cities. Gabe, so I, I've, I've read your book, and you talk about a whole collection of your experiences. It seems like you're trying to impart wisdom about how to run an organization, in particular uh, a city organization, a mm -hmm. department of transportation. So you want to give me what you, what, you know, kind of your main takeaways that you're trying yeah. to communicate that motivated you to write the book. You know, the genesis of the book was um, after working, you know, 15 years in the private sector and startups and companies, then getting uh, drafted into uh, government and not really knowing what to expect uh, and having a steep learning curve and then coming out of it and realizing that um, there are a lot of similarities, or there can be, between work in the private and the public sector. And I was getting asked to speak you know, around the country, even outside of the country, and people kept asking me the same recurring questions. You know, how do you get so much done so quickly in a big bureaucratic government in, in environment? How do you set goals and then get all the stakeholders to align around them? How do you find the money? to fund some of these things, like the bike lanes in Chicago where we had no budget? Um, or how do you market this to all of your stakeholders and, and the public? So I guess you know, what I came to realize was that if we take more of a private sector approach within government, um, obviously you're working for the greater good, right? To prioritize the, the constituent or the citizen or the consumer, whatever you want to call them. And from a management standpoint, really try to break down these big goals that we have, like Vision Zero, or um, 100 miles of bike lanes, or a new bike sharing program, using a private sector approach to break that down to manageable steps to delegate properly, and then to go ahead and execute quickly. There seemed to be a lot of interest in that. And so the purpose of the book was to be really sort of fun. I mean, you're one of the most accomplished commissioners of a Department of Transportation in, in recent history in, in the United States. I mean, you went into D.C., whole slew of innovations there, uh, bike share, putting in the first protected bike lanes, um, transit innovations, and then you went to, to Chicago and did a lot of those things. And again, huge amount of innovation, very quickly, all worked really well. As I was reading the book, I, I thought like, well, I mean, you had a couple things in common in both cases, is that you had you know, really driven, innovative, honest mayors who were looking to get things done, who were you know, willing to hire someone yeah. who, was, who was innovative, willing to you know, ruffle feathers, stand behind mm -hmm. you when things got tough, because it, in, inevitably it does. Thank you for the compliment, because that, that means a lot. And you know, it was very tough work. Those were the two hardest jobs that I've ever done, but also two of the most rewarding jobs. And I do have to give those two mayors, Mayor Adrian Fenty and, and Mayor Rahm uh, uh, Emanuel, a lot of credit because they chose somebody that was not the norm. You know? And I think that's actually a big part of the recipe. And I think you know, picking somebody that comes at the problem with a different point of view uh, is very important. Um, you know, not the same sort of engineering viewpoint. You know, it's sort of someone who came up through the ranks or not somebody who's getting the job for a political favor, you know, but somebody who has passion, somebody who understands how to manage. This was also a pretty magical time. Um, you know, the president was coming in uh, when I got my job in Washington, D.C. It was obvious that there was going to be a sea change in terms of urban policy in the United States and a real focus on cities again. Uh, and so that was very helpful. I would say that federal DOT, uh, at least from an administrative and policy standpoint, was a real partner to us in D.C. and Chicago. So one of the things that yeah. I think really helped you be such a huge success in your job is that you had a vision for what cities could be that was beyond just, I'm moving cars. And public space is a big part of that. It's interesting that, I mean, what we're looking at here, this isn't transportation at all, yet somehow, because right. it's street space, now transportation commissioners have to know this stuff. Totally, and, and I think it's also your view of what transportation is. And historically, we think of transportation as cars, buses, trains, and it's also walking. 
Uh, and I think that when I came into the job, I realized like, wow, we control like a third of the public space in the city with these streets and it's all allocated to cars. And I learned a lot. You know, I listened to a lot of advocates that have been advocating for years in Washington. I learned from Streets Blog. And uh, it, it was very helpful to sort of get immersed and become part of that movement. I also grew up as a cyclist. You know, I grew up from the age of five, working in bike stores, loving bikes. So to me, it just, it came naturally to reimagine streets around uh, people. So we, in New York City, we had Jeanette Sadakan as our commissioner here who was one of those people, you know, who, who was yeah. driven to get things done, willing to take risks, did a huge number of things, and occasionally there was, you know, huge backlash against her. Mm -hmm. the, the next mayor came in and I think the mandate was like, don't, don't make waves. And so it's a very different political in, environment. I met with her before I even took the job and, and we talked a lot about, and, and I also talk about this in the book, we talked about the importance of piloting, uh, of being able to make mistakes. Um, and coming from a startup background where you're constantly, you know, iterating and trying things and screwing up and learning and then refocusing, that came really naturally to me. So that was great advice from her. And you're absolutely right. I mean, having a boss that has your back, particularly you know, not just when you ultimately succeed, but when you screw up and fail is huge. If you get rid of somebody every time they make a mistake, you're not going to have any employees, you know. And in a political environment, there's such a risk aversion to stepping out. And so props to Bloomberg, props to Adrian Fenty, Rahm Emanuel, and all the mayors out there who encourage people actually to iterate and try things. And it's the responsible thing to do in terms of tax dollars. And, and there's another example in the book about revamping the parking system in DC, where like typically what you do is you go out and do a multi-million dollar, multi-year RFP, right? And everybody submits their bids, and then you sort of hope for the best. You you implement a giant system, you spend all this money. And what Jeanette did in New York, what I tried to do is we would try things. So I tested eight different parking systems in Washington. We got the public to give us feedback on what worked. And only then did we make a decision about the configuration of parking. So after we implemented the pay by phone parking system as part of, of, of the whole implementation in Washington DC, um, the uptake's been incredible. And we now have over 60% of the transactions in DC for parking are by pay by phone. Um, and that means more turnover. Um, we also were able to raise the rates because um, people are much more willing to accept higher rates if something works better. Here we are on Canal Street, which is you know, obviously a big through street in New York. Yeah. Traffic choked all the time really inhospitable. And you were just making a really interesting comment about, because we just saw some cyclists trying to cycle yeah. on Canal. Uh, uh, the, you, you said that DC is way more bike friendly than New York, and, and why is that? Well, I, you know, I feel from my point of view that in the last 10 years, DC has traffic calmed itself so much. Um, between the sort of evolution of cycling in the city, more people walking, more density, um, and uh, more of a balance, I think, between uh, cars and active transportation. It's just resulted in people driving slower, being more respectful. People drive slow here due to congestion, but when they can, they hit the gas and they'll do 50 miles an hour. We have so many speed cameras in DC. We have stop sign cameras now. Um, you just don't do that anymore. And so it, it's a combination, it's not one thing, but a combination of efforts has made it friendly for cyclists on streets with no bike lane. Why don't you tell us what DC did with automated enforcement? Because I think in terms of implementable technologies mm -hmm. that can make a difference right now, yeah. automated enforcement is it. And so what yeah. did DC do? It is immediate. So it was before I got there and it, uh, it emanated from the police department actually. Around the year 2000, 2001, they started testing automated speed enforcement in the city. Um, uh, they also started testing red light cameras and they quickly realized that it, it was slowing people down. What was very interesting was that, you know, in a lot of places you have people fighting back and saying, oh, I don't want a speed camera. Well, people actually were writing us and saying, no, no, we do want speed cameras. We want it on our street. Um, how come you put one on that street and not on this I street? I desperately want one on my yeah. street. I mean, I would, I would pay for it myself if I, I mean, it would make my kids safer, you know? Yeah, so it was this kind of thing where, where the government had the vision to do it. Uh, it was not the public. 
but then the public got on board and now there's been a proliferation and it's just accepted as part of the landscape. So it's expanded dramatically and they even have stop sign uh, cameras now. It's the knowing that they're out there, it's the psychology of knowing that there could be one on, on every street corner that changes the way people drive citywide. You also discussed the future of transportation. Mm -hmm. and, and I really wanted to have a, a discussion about that. What are cities going to look like 30, 40, 50 years from now? Mm. Particularly for big cities where private vehicle ownership basically goes away. Exactly. No on-street parking. Mm -hmm. The amount of traffic can probably collapse by 80, 90 percent with better service. Yep. The amount of road space you need to give to cars maybe goes down by 50, 75 percent, and that huge spatial dividend mm -hmm. can go to people, to living, you know, kids playing in the street again. All of that stuff is possible, and the technology is right around the corner for that. Everything you said is correct, and the thing is, we can grasp this opportunity once, you know, and, it, and it's basically right now, because these cars are going to be on the road in the next few years. I just got a Volvo, because I have a baby now, and it's got, um, autonomous features in it. It stops on its own if it senses anything around it. So the, the features are being woven together already by the car companies. The Silicon Valley companies are doing their own thing. They're going straight to like fully autonomous, you know, uh, Google in particular, but also Apple. Um, and so it's this opportunity, and I've been working with NACTO, with the team there, Jeanette, on, you know, how do cities get together and coalesce around a framework and a set of policies that make sense because the cities have so much power if they work together and that's why I think NACTO and Streets Blog and you know there's some key organizations that are so important to this movement but in terms of all the individual things you talked about I mean storage uh, of vehicles on our street can basically go away uh, we could get rid of you know 85 percent of parking in buildings and what if we took that money and applied it to affordable housing in cities we're talking about potentially being able to actually do Vision Zero. Like transit gets redefined completely, right? What is transit? It could be these vans you're talking about, uh, convoying with regular cars, convoying with a traditional bus, all being used for the same service, but diverting off their fixed route when they need to, right? And so if we embrace this technology and we shape the policies around it, we can make cities truly safe like my vision is for my daughter you know I just had a daughter last year she's only 16 months old when she's eight which will be in 2023 I'd like for her to be able to walk to school on her own without me having to worry about her and I actually believe we can do it now